The 2023 World Pro Ski Tour held its World Championships in Taos, New Mexico for the second consecutive year. The best racers from the World Pro Ski Tour and World Cup ascended on the Taos Ski Valley to crown two champions over the course of two days. Up for grabs is the World Championship, given to the racer who performs best over the two days of competition. Not only will these top racers contend for the World Championship, but they will also have their eyes set on first place in the season-long point standing of the World Pro Ski Tour. Day one saw the top skiers in the world face the challenging conditions in the super slalom. On the men's side, Rito Schmidiger was victorious in the finals against Czech's Philippe Forcek, with Germany's David Ketterer finishing third. On the women's side, American Paula Moltsen defeated current Women's World Pro Ski Tour points leader, Canadian Aaron Milzinski. Day two saw the weather clear, providing excellent conditions for the giant slalom. For the men, could Switzerland's Rito Schmidiger hold his lead to capture the world title? Can Simone Kamalander, after a quarterfinal loss on day one, hang on as the tour's leading point getter? And on the women's side, could Aaron Milzinski or Trisha Mangan catch Paula Molson? Can Aaron capture both titles with a victory on day two? On this episode, we'll sit down with American favorite Trisha Mangan and two-time U.S. Olympic gold medal winner Ted Ligety. It all comes your way next on Life In Between Gates. This is the World Pro Ski Tour. For more than half a century, Seiko has been supporting athletes in their efforts to be the best. Now, we want to bring this reliable technology to anyone striving for a goal. Because we understand, a split second can change everything. Keep going forward. Prospects. Introducing the first ever Mazda CX-50. Life in Between Gates is brought to you by Clicker, Celsius, Seiko, Mazda, and Taos, home of the 2023 World Pro Ski Tour World Championships. I'm John Franklin, CEO of the World Pro Ski Tour and Ski Racing Media. And we're here for day two of the World Pro Ski Tour World Championships in Taos, New Mexico. Today is a giant solemn. Giant Slalom, the gates are wider, the track runs faster, 
The racers are on longer skis and they are excited about the hard snow, the clear skies, the great weather, and everybody is ready to rock and roll day two of the World Championships. 39-year-old Ted Ligety is a living legend in the world of American ski racing. In 2006, he won gold in the combined event at the Winter Olympics. Eight years later, he captured the giant slalom and took home his second Olympic gold medal at the 2014 Games in Sochi. A five-time World Cup champion, he won the gold medal in the giant slalom at the 2011 World Championships. His Olympic giant slalom gold medal, 24 World Cup wins, three World Championships, and five World Cup titles put him among the three greatest giant slalom skiers of all time. I've been retired from ski racing for two years, and this is really the first time I'm back in Gates. I mean, I do my uh, local Park City Beer League okay. every every third weekend of the of the season for fun. But otherwise, yeah, I really haven't skied Gates much since uh, I retired from World Cup. I do a little bit of skiing with the Park City ski team here and there, just kind of for fun. But uh, yeah, this is. Uh, this is the first time really for real competition. <laughs> oh, it's just kind of fun. It's uh, I think the Pro Tour is a, is a fun event, but also it's like, it's nice to scratch the competitive itch here and there. I mean, um, I don't know how competitive I really am. I've been away from it for a while and I'm not like training at a high level or anything, but it's just kind of fun to get back into it and, and you go up against, you know, a bunch of the guys I, I raced with for a lot of years and um, see where I stack up, but also just more just for the fun of it. And um, I think for the GS, maybe I have a little more chance of, of being a competitive, but for Super Slalom, it's a, it's a challenge for me on the little guy, on the little skis. As a kid, I've been a fan of skiing. Well, I've been, a, I'm still a fan of skiing, still much since I was, you know, racing all the way till now. Um, and grew up watching the Pro Tour as a little kid. And, you know, I was lucky to grow up in Park City where we had the World Cup every year, but uh, the Pro Tour would come through every once in a while as well. And, you know, seeing Bernie Knaus and, and some guys like that go through and, and hammer away was really cool. And then to see it come back was fun. I did a couple of them while I was still racing World Cup. And so that was fun to kind of mix that in there and to support you know, ski racing beyond just the World Cup tour is, is really cool, especially here in the US, you know, giving, you know, some of the next generation, but kind of some people that are in between World Cup and Norams, the opportunity to go out there and, and race for money is important. I think that's fun to be able to help sustain that skiing ecosystem. I was an old guy on the tour for a long time, so it's been fun to, you know, grow up with some of the some of the young guys. I mean, now guys like River Adamus, he was a kid when I first started, but uh, not a kid anymore, obviously. So it's fun to be able to interact with those guys and see them come on into their own. You know, somebody like Tommy Ford, you know, he was a 19-year-old kid, you know, coming on the US ski team and seeing him like evolve to going on to go win World Cups is cool to like see that next transition, next generation coming up. And I think the Pro Tour is a great way is for those guys to have that next little outlet and, and you know, continue evolving their skiing path. For this weekend, I mean, I think, you know, the Reed brothers are gonna be tough. They're both fast today. Um, River, I mean, he's, you know, the whole hometown guy here in Taos, so he can be really competitive, really good on the World Cup tour. Been very good, actually, in the Giants Slalom duels on the World Cup as well. Helped the, the team win a, a gold medal there in World Champs, so, you know, I think he's gonna be tough, especially on the Giants Slalom side of things. Um, and then, you know, some of the, the veterans on the, the pro tour, you know, the Mike Lankanese guys like that could be really tough. My first couple years in the ski team, you know, having, you know, mentors like Dane Spencer and Chip Knight were really important. But then, you know, of course, Bodie was winning races at that time. So, I mean, he was somebody I looked up to a ton. And even well before I made the ski team, he was definitely a hero of mine. And to go race him and then, you know, beat him here and there was, was obviously uh, really cool. And when you're on this U.S. ski team, you're traveling on the road for six plus months out of the year with each other, like hotel to hotel. And so you get to know the, the group of people on the team really, really well. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of like a little bit of a, a brotherhood in some senses. So, you know, you get close to each other and it's, yeah, it's fun. It's a different world. I mean, since you stopped racing, I've stopped racing. We've kind of gone our separate ways, but we, we stay in touch here and there. I think when you look at like U.S. skiing in general, you see that like, oh, we have all this young talent and then they fizzle out when they go to the highest stage. And I think being on the road for six months straight is the separator for us. I mean, I think there's not that many people that can 
deal with that kind of travel and you know when you're traveling the road for six months if things aren't going well for you for a couple weeks it's hard to pick yourself up and not get stuck in a downward spiral and so I guess I was able to embrace the road life and um, was able to get myself out of those funks and so I was I enjoyed being on the road I liked it um, later in my career of course like I was lucky my my girlfriend who became my wife and then the mother of my kids was traveling on the road for the last you know five or so, so years of my career and then my son traveled on my oldest traveled on the road with me um, for the first two years of his life so we went to 13 countries by the time he is one um, and so that was nice to like have that like home unit on the road and then the last couple of years I would just do like two weeks on two weeks off um, which was which is brutal um, so that part of it started worrying on me at the end I have a five-year-old and I have two and a half year old twins all boys yeah, with three kids and the two-year-old twins, you know, home life is, is chaos as anybody can imagine with three boys running around. So I always just say I'll repaint the inside and re-drywall when they're six. <laughs> so they're just tearing the place apart, but they're, they're a lot of fun. The five-year-olds skiing quite a bit, trying to get the two-year-olds on snow a little bit. It's uh, obviously a challenge when it's uh, zone defense and not man to man um, but you know it, it's fun there it's a different world and I think having finished my career two years ago as a ski racer going straight from like that into having a family you don't have like time to like get in your mind as far as like oh what am I gonna do next you're like you have your life and you have your purpose set out right away my five-year-old, he went to the Olympics in 2018. I mean, he was nine months old, so of course he doesn't remember that. Um, and he has some memories of like when I was still ski racing because he was, you know, three and a half then. But, you know, for a while there, he's like, why do people always like come up to you and know who you are? And uh, he like, he understands that. And now he like, people actually come up to him and know who he is because like they see like my Instagram videos of him skiing or whatnot. So um, he kind of understands. I don't think he like, has a true understanding, but he kind of gets to like, daddy was a, a good skier or, <laughs> and whatnot. Let's see what the sunny skies here in Taos have to offer. Fossa Norway Blue, Ligeti, USA Red. Right. Let's watch the lights. Start. Yellow, yellow, yellow. Now back in the tail of your season. It's closed and the doors open up, out on track they go. Looks like the youngster got a little bit of a jump on Ted. Down the pitch they go. Mr. GS, let's see what he has today. The youngster out front still a little bit. Here comes Ted on the red course side. Really gets some good angles. Pressing his key for some energy. The youngster out front. So fouls uh, putting the hammer down. Here comes Ligeti grabbing the bullet, trying to get as much energy as he can out of the ski as they make the turn flat up there. It's going to get kind of peely as we say today out there making the turn. Fouls out in front over Ligeti in their first of two runs in round of 32. It's going to be the blue course crossing the line first with the advantage of 0.285. 0.285 for Fauza, applying pressure to Ligeti. Fauza with a surprising run there. I shouldn't say surprising, he's a great skier. Uh, Ted Ligeti, Mr. GS. Uh, it was close, only 2.8. So, doors will open up for Fauza, but Ted gets a good strong start despite the advantage that was given to Fauza at the start. So he's figured out how to get out of there quick. Out front, both of them have a little bit of struggle at the top jump. Out front is Ligeti, but here comes Fauza as he did the first run, pulls alongside, they'll make the turn. Ted will pick up time. Got to stay focused on your own course. Can't worry about where your competitor is. You make the turn, you know you gain that advantage. Back over the bottom jump. Looks like Ligeti might have an advantage on that angle, but I don't think from the other angle it's going to be enough. It's oh. not. It's going to be Fauza with a 3-7-3 advantage. Two good close runs. On goes Luis Fauza, Norwegian. When we return to Life in Between Gates, we sit down with two-time Olympian, American Trisha Mangan. Native of Buffalo, New York, 26-year-old Trisha Mangan has competed in the last two Winter Olympics in 2018 and 2022. In 2022, Mangan finished second in Taos in the Super Slalom behind eventual champion Paula Molson. After a fourth place finish on day one this year, she has her sights set on turning the tables and capturing the championship for herself. Hi, I'm Trisha Mangan. I'm 26 years old and I'm from Buffalo, New York. 
So I grew up racing at Hollymont in Ellicottville, New York, which is about an hour south of where I live in Buffalo. It has a impressive 700 vertical feet, <laughs> but it's a really nice family-oriented club um, and has a super special community. So I started racing there with my four brothers when I was about six years old. And then I also have a sister, a younger sister, who joined us a couple years later. And yeah, skiing has definitely started as a family thing. All of my siblings did it. I was definitely super competitive, especially with my twin brother. So that was super motivating for me. I often credit a lot of my success to just wanting to beat him when I was younger. I think that also coming from a small mountain teaches you to be kind of resilient and gritty because you're definitely at a disadvantage for resources and time on snow and everything. So you kind of have to um, compensate for that uh, in other ways, which I think was and is still a huge advantage in my skiing. My oldest brother often says that like the reason I made it so far is just because I hated losing the most, which I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I definitely love racing and love working hard to get faster. So for me, it was like all part of the process. Um, so I, I really enjoyed it. And I think I'm getting better at losing because I definitely do it a lot on the World Cup. But that's kind of part of the process is like wanting to get faster after every run, no matter where you are. And I definitely think I have that. So I actually think I'm pretty unique in that I like didn't have a big picture. I, I hardly even knew what the US ski team was. Um, like, of course I knew Lindsey Vaughn and Bodie Miller, but like there was no, I want to be on the US ski team. Like I want to go to the Olympics. It was, it was truly just like, I want to be my brother, I want to be the fastest one on the hill. And then I'd say a big pivotal moment for me was at my first year at U16 Nationals. Um, I qualified for that and went out to Park City and I didn't even know it was a race and I got absolutely crushed. I always knew that there were like way better girls out there from Vermont and Colorado and everywhere out west, but I think being there in person with them and seeing that level really motivated me to be to work hard and get there the next year. So then that whole following year, that was my goal. It was like, go to U16 Nationals and don't get last. And um, I did qualify again and I went there and I ended up third overall, um, or maybe fourth, but I, I did way, way better. And that qualified me for the junior national team. And then that was kind of like a big launching point for me. Education has always been super important to me. I love school, I'm a huge nerd, but I think that mostly like I am super intense when it comes to skiing, so having something else going on actually helps me a ton with managing the balance of like intensity and in skiing and then other things in life as well. Engineering, at least in my experience, played to similar strengths as why I was good at skiing, like breaking down problems, seeing how you could fix things to get a little bit faster, or make things a little bit more efficient. Um, so yeah, I loved engineering and um, I, since graduating, have done a lot of part-time roles and internships, um, so I'm super excited for what's next. But I think that for me, balancing a ton of things and having a ton on my plate has been super beneficial um, in kind of teaching me that you can always do more than you think you can. And uh, especially my last two years as an independent athlete racing on the World Cup has been super, super challenging, but I know that like I can do really hard things and manage a ton of stuff. So that's kind of given me confidence to take on these um, bigger, bigger things and not be overwhelmed. That was similar to kind of my mindset growing up and like what I've had progressing through skiing the entire time is like, I really just look like a couple steps ahead and focus on the small things that are gonna get me there. And I think that comes, that's helpful because it allows you to focus on like the day-to-day -day grind and then you get to the end of the season and you're like, wow, I've progressed a ton. Um, so there wasn't really any like huge switch to World Cup 
I did start racing World Cup Tech when I was pretty young and was definitely getting crushed, <laughs> which was hard, but um, I knew that that step was really, really challenging and I knew that all it was going to take was a lot more work and I was willing to just work hard and see if it was enough and a lot of years it wasn't, but I still was making huge steps and progress in my skiing. and. I think that's something I've been super fortunate in is that I truly feel like every year um, I'm getting a little bit better, which is super rewarding and continues to motivate me. This is my first weekend at the World Pro Tour and it's super fun because it's the World Championships and I actually came to this event last year, so I had it on my radar all year and was definitely looking forward to it, so super happy to be here. I did primarily Super G and downhill this year and um, here we're on slalom skis and GS skis, so that's a huge difference. Um, my first couple turns on the slalom skis, I like, almost went head over um, my tips because they're so small. So that was a big change and then, yeah, of course the dual format um, is very different, the start is super different, so yeah, it's a lot of fun. I actually was quite nervous, um, even just for the qualifiers, and I had to tell myself, like, you need to conserve the energy because you have a lot of runs, whereas in speed, you just take one run, so you can kind of, like, build up to super high intensity and then go, but um, there's definitely a bit of energy um, conservation going on at the Pro Tour. Now it's gonna go Holtman Mangan, Trisha Mangan, wild ride all day yesterday with three crashes, but able to hold on for a uh, fourth place finish. We go on now to uh, Miss Mina Holtman from Norway. She's on the red course, off and running. Here we go. Mangan gets the jump on the even start in the first run here. Mangan out in front by about a ski's length. Did they touch down? Two turns to go to the boot course. Let's see how the ladies handle it. Good turns by Mangan. Gets her skis back on the ground right at the gate. Gets some energy out of it, makes the turn. Mangan out in front, heading for the waterfall, jump on the blue side. Big enough advantage to hold off Holtman as she touches down out front, running away at the line. It's gonna be Mangan crossing first with the advantage, 0.674 for Mangan. As Trisha Mangan out of Buffalo, New York, Dartmouth College, two-time Olympian. She's on the red course. Mina Holtman from Norway. She's on the blue, off and running. So Mangan's doors opening first. So over on the red course side, that was 6.74 tenths of a second. Advantage built in for Mangan. She touches down, a little unbalanced on that red side. Coming alongside is Holtman on the blue. Mangan still out front, but here we know. It gets into your head. You get around that corner and head through the alley. Pro Alley in the blue course picks up the advantage. They make the turn on the red course side. Mangan out in front, closing in on the win on the red course side. It's super close. It's going to be Mangan first at the line, winning by three. Three eight for Mangan into the semifinals. Goes Mangan over Holtman. Up next, the racers reflect on Taos as host of the 2023 World Championships. In general, ski racing is a pretty tough sport. Racers ready? Using my DNA vibe has allowed me to train harder, longer, and recover faster. Less days off, more time on the snow, beating my competitors. Having another option to be doing what we love and to continue to race, it just keeps the sport open, keeps you in it. For more than half a century, Seiko has been supporting athletes in their efforts to be the best. Now, we want to bring this reliable technology to anyone striving for a goal. Because we understand, a split second can change everything. Keep going forward. Prospects. Here is a place situated off the map of ordinary, a place that is independent, free-spirited, and intimate in scale. A place that since its first lift was installed over 60 years ago, has strived to stay true to its roots while growing better rather than bigger. This vision for the future has helped make us the first ski resort in the world to earn B Corp certification. It's a symbol of where we're headed and what we stand for. We hope you will join us.
I'm Brett Halsness. This is a uh, uh, Surefoot course description. Come on, Brett! All right, here we go. It's not going to be too ruddy as yesterday, but first jump. It's going to be a while. Oh. All three jumps are right footers. You launch on that one, pick up a lot of pace. And now you want to just get in your tuck. Break that gate. Here comes the final jump. It's getting kind of ruddy, but it's very fast down here. Nice. Temperatures right now are getting pretty mild. It's in the 40s someplace. Uh, the snow is super soft. It's getting ruddy, it's getting tracky, but uh, it is fast. It's, it's very fast. I'm Britta Halsness. That's my Surefoot course description. Year one was the kickoff year. Everything worked beautifully. I, I'll, I'll never forget. We were at the podiums and everyone said, are we doing this again? It's like, why wouldn't we? So here we are, year two, we're back, and things are going beautifully. We're really, really happy that the tour is here. There's no better place in the country to do world championships. We have a great partnership. They support us, we support them. We bring the message, the B Corp message of Taos all over the world. We have a shared ethos, and we love coming to Taos. No, we've got some of the best skiers in the world on our mountain. We couldn't be happier. Huge opportunity to come here and have such a high level and really good competition. And so I just love every round of it and having a ton of fun here at the house. And it's fun having an athlete-led event, right? Like it's this two-way communication. The Pro Tour guys, the athletes, we're making decisions together. We want to have a fun event. We want to put on a good show. So it's really like a, a neat culture that the Pro Tour has. And it's really just about good vibes. The community and the vibes here and the atmosphere is honestly like nothing else. And everyone is so, so nice and kind and it just feels so great to be here. This has been, I think, the most fun competition and whole setup I've ever been to. It was great to race at Taos. I think the atmosphere was amazing. Uh, the hill was amazing. We just had a lot of fun. Coming up next, part two of our sit-down with two-time Olympic gold medalist, Ted Ligety. Hi, my name is Mark Daneman. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Peak Ski Company. We're here in beautiful Taos, New Mexico at the World Pro Ski Tour Championships. Peak Ski Company is a brand new ski brand out of Bozeman, Montana. Our skis are largely designed by Bodie Miller. We incorporate some unique technology, including our keyhole, which is a cutout of the metal portion of the ski. This serves to soften the tip of the ski a little bit, allowing for easier turn initiation, keeps you over the center of the ski, doesn't kick you on the tail, but you don't sacrifice the torsional rigidity, the twisting rigidity of the ski, which is where a lot of the power comes from out of your turn. We're a direct-to-consumer ski company, so you go to peakskis.com to check out our product. You can purchase our skis, and we have a fantastic 30-day money-back guarantee. If you get the skis, you got a month to ski them. You can mount your bindings. If you don't like the ski, you can return them for another model or size, or just get your money back. So if you want peak performance out of your skiing, go to peakskis.com. I started skiing when I was two, and that's the obvious thing to do when you're living in Park City. Neither of my parents were ski racers. They grew up skiing here and there. They're transplants from the East Coast to Park City in the 70s, so um, not like competitive racers. I mean, they didn't choose ski racing as like a thing for me. It was that my buddies were going to ski racing, so I joined them with that. Um, so it was a way to kind of keep me out of trouble, more or less, as a teenager. My dad went to the university, like he's from Connecticut, he went to the University of Utah. Um, so he came in college in the 60s and then my mom moved there in you know, the mid 70s for nursing. So like 
just yeah went that way you know well before Park City was the Park City is today. I see people and they're like, oh, how long did you move to Park City? I'm like, I, 38 years ago, <laughs> since, I was, since I was born here, yeah. I really started ski racing when I was about 10 years old, which I guess like nowadays seems really old. Um, I mean, I did like some NASCAR courses before that, but when the, when the Olympics were in 1994 and Tommy Mo won the gold medal, that's I think when I first like looked at ski racing, it's like, oh, that's cool, I wanna do that, so. Yeah, when I was about 10 years old, joined the Park City Ski Team, and that was like my main friend group. Like, all my buddies were racing. Yeah, 94, 95, yeah. If you look at like my career as a kid, like I was not a good or standout ski racer until I was 18 years old, really. I mean, I was like 75th at World, or at, uh, at the Junior Olympics, like the Regional Junior Olympics, when I was 13, 14 years old. So, not on the trajectory to make the US Ski Team or anything like that. When I was, 16, I remember like a tough day of training. My coach was like, if you really work hard, you could be a good college ski racer. So that was kind of my trajectory. And then, you know, figured out some things in my skiing. You know, I was not being good. I was given permission to kind of go plan my skis and go free ski a lot and not do the whole normal like regimented thing. And that allowed me to flourish and made this US ski team the year after high school. You know, when I made the US ski team, I was just on the development team, but when we were training in the fall with the World Cup team and all of a sudden I was winning a lot of runs. And so I was like, ah, uh -uh. like I can be as fast as anybody. Uh, and, and then went to some Norams and was like top five and those with the World Cup field and started racing World Cup basically right away. Like as a development team kid, racing World Cup was pretty crazy and then scored, scored World Cup points later that year. So it was like slowly making it, made the US ski team. Then I instantly, you know, shot straight up to, to being, you know, very, very good right away. Yeah, my first World Cup was 2003, uh, November 2003 in Park City. I started 69th, finished 59th. Um, so, I mean, I was just like psyched to be racing there. I didn't really have any expectations. I knew that my chances were, were slim at that time, but just psyched to be able to race it. And then I raced World Cup for 18 years. So nonstop for 18 years, long, long career, a lot, of, a lot of time on the road. I mean, I was lucky to have, you know, an amazing career, I think, yeah, from, you know, I won five GS Globes between 2008 and 2014, and, you know, for a five-year stretch there, I was winning, you know, over 50% of the Giant Slums on the World Cup, so um, tremendous success, and that was, you know, so much fun. I mean, when you get on a roll, it's hard to, it's hard to break momentum, you know? It's, uh, you, you start feeling good, and you get on a roll, and you can just keep going at it, and that was fun. Being a professional ski racer was a 365 day a year job. I mean, I was training in the gym all summer long and then working out. And I mean, the last like eight years of my career is when my body really started breaking down. I blew out my knee and I had back problems and this and that. And so I, you know, by the end of it, I had a bunch of back surgeries and that's like ultimately what ended up doing it for me. So yeah, when you're healthy, you have to take advantage of it. But you know, there's few, World Cup racers that get to be 30 years old without having back problems, so I was not alone in that in that journey. Going to my first Olympics in 2006 was a dream come true. I was like a 21-year-old kid still living at home with my parents, so just psyched to be there and then to go in my first event, which is the combined. I'd been having a great season leading up to that. I'd been on the podium a couple times, but was not really expecting to win a medal, so to go into the first event you know, there's a downhill and two slalom runs and was like in 35th place after the first one of the downhill. First one of the slalom, I was, you know, by far the fastest in that run, went up to third. And I remember sitting sitting in the lodge between runs leading up to the, the last run of slalom, you're like, holy cow, like what would my th friends think back home if I actually won a, won a medal? And I was like, got super nervous and I was like, oh, I just gotta put that out of my mind and went up there and laid down another amazing run of slalom and ended up winning that. And it was just crazy to think that in my first Olympics, first Olympic event, to reach a childhood dream of winning a gold medal was, was surreal. I still pinch myself to this day. I don't know, it's hard to like say which, which kid's your favorite, you know? It's, it's hard to say which gold medal is your favorite. Um, I mean, it's high up there. I think both my gold medals come at like such totally different times in my career and it's like totally different expectation levels. Um, there I wasn't expecting to win a gold medal and to like reach a childhood dream 
right away was, you know, I was 21 years old and yeah, surreal experience, like out of body, like excitement. Um, whereas when I won in 2014, I was the far and away favorite. Um, it was going to be a major failure if I didn't win. So like crossing the finish line there and winning was like, whew, I actually like followed through on this one. And then ski racing, if anybody follows it, like by and large, the favorites don't win at the Olympics um, because it's like, well, it's one race, you know, the margins of error are so small. Um, the Olympics can be kind of like a little bit interesting snow condition wise, or like a little bit outside the norm. And so to follow through and actually come through on the biggest day was, was a huge relief. When we return to Life in Between Gates, it's part two of our interview with American Trisha Mangan. situated off the map of ordinary, a place that is independent, free-spirited, and intimate in scale. A place that since its first lift was installed over 60 years ago, has strived to stay true to its roots while growing better rather than bigger. This vision for the future has helped make us the first ski resort in the world to earn B Corp certification. It's a symbol of where we're headed and what we stand for. We hope you will join us. the first ever Mazda CX-50. When I decided to go to Dartmouth and race for the Dartmouth, Dartmouth and the US ski team, after that year, I, I didn't qualify again for the ski team, so that was kind of my first year as an independent. And then the past two years, I've raced as an independent on the World Cup, and that was a tremendous effort. Uh, I don't think I quite realized how hard it was going to be until I was in it, but it also taught me so much. And I often say that the biggest silver lining of racing independent is that I was forced to ask people for help and reach out to my community because I simply could not do it alone. And that has been a huge blessing because it's made me realize just how special the ski racing community is and how many people do want to support me and help me succeed even if I'm not getting the support of the national team. And that has just been really, really special for me. And I think that sometimes when you do have everything all cut out for you, it's easy to be in your own little bubble and focus just on the skiing. But me racing independent kind of forced me to take a step back and reach out to the larger ski racing community and then also pay it forward to the ski racing community as well and, and do a lot of events for younger athletes and help people because I know how special it has been for me for people to help me. 2018 was a very crazy experience for me. I was actually the last alternate onto the US Olympic team, so I found out about four days before opening ceremonies in flu, two days after. So it was a huge whirlwind, and it was definitely tons of emotions. Um, I felt a little bit like, oh, I don't deserve this, or I need to prove myself because I'm the alternate. Uh, which was stressful, um, but again, it was really just me wanting to put my best skiing forward and work really hard and prove that I belonged at that event. Looking back, I probably would have been a little bit kinder on myself, but I definitely took that experience into my second Olympics. 
last year and had a really, really positive experience there. So the opening ceremonies of my first Olympics were definitely one of the coolest moments of my life because as I said, it was such a whirlwind leading up to that and I didn't, I was just so stressed. I didn't really take a moment to be like, wow, you made it. And then going to opening ceremonies was so special and really, really cool in a, like a huge, oh my gosh, like I'm here moment. So my first event was the giant slalom and it actually got postponed, which was really nice because the snow there was so different and grippy. So it gave me a couple more days to um, train and practice and feel good. Unfortunately, I did DNF in the first run. I had um, a big, like caught my edge and high sided and crashed. So that was a bit disappointing, but DNFing as always, I think that outside of the ski racing world, it can be perceived as like this terrible thing. But to me, um, it means that like I'm putting myself out there and on the line and like willing to push the limits. So I was bummed, but I, I knew that like I, I was there to push the limits and see how fast I could go. So that was my first event. And then the second was the team event. Um, and that was super fun because I, you don't really race as a team ever in ski racing, so it was just totally different. And the older athletes on the team, like Nolan and David and Megan, uh, were all veterans, and then there was me. So I was um, definitely taken under the wing and tried my best to ski as, as fast as possible for them. But yeah, that was a great experience. I definitely remember at the end of that Olympics being, thinking to myself, if I go to another Olympics, I want to be in a position where I can really contend and try to be a little bit more competitive. Um, so yeah, that was, that was definitely motivational. I think like a bit of uh, misunderstanding in winter Olympic sports is that like the Olympics are the only thing that matter, but like each season we have a World Cup season which some people think are even harder than the Olympic events because there's more girls there. So um, each year is really important. And throughout the year, like April, the end of April when the competition period ends is probably the two, three weeks of the year that I don't think about skiing <laughs> and I try to decompress as much as possible. Um, but then we kind of jump right into spring camps. We have really intense dry land summer training. We go to the Southern Hemisphere to train on snow, and then the competition period is, is really October to end of March. So it's a pretty much year-round sport. In the summers, I usually work in some sort of internship or part-time role, which has been good to kind of get my mind off of skiing and um, flex my brain in a different way. My family also runs a summer day camp at our house, which I started when I was 14 as a way to fund my skiing. And we've continued that now for 10 plus years, which is really special. So that's a highlight of the summer. And yeah, I, I love doing anything outside, hanging with friends, um, learning new things really just staying as busy as possible. So my brothers and I have recently gotten into kiteboarding, which is so fun. Um, we also love biking. I love running, but I pretty much only do it in the spring just because of training purposes. And love, love water sports. So pretty much any game. I used to play, I played competitive soccer all the way through high school. So I also love playing pickup soccer, but don't do that so much anymore. My final rounds for the ladies. Here we go. The cage has begun. Man get on the blue. And we guard on the red course side. On track they go. Looks like maybe a little bit of a jump on the blue course side, if any, between these two. Mangan approaches the jump, loses the outside ski a little bit. Here comes Hammergard right alongside her. Anybody's race into the second jump, see how they land it. A little bit wild on the blue course side. Anybody's race still as they make the turn. Blue course going to pull away. Mangan got that psychological advantage when you come across there, but you know when you're on that red course, you hit the waterfall, you can pick up some speed. Out in front is Mengen pulling away on the blue course side. Hammergard trying to close it down, and it's going to be the win going to Mengen by 2-6-9 for Mengen in their first of two runs in the semis. 
Crucial timing to get that advantage and take advantage of it. Trisha Mengen ready to go out on track. She goes. Good clean start. Two tenths of a second difference between the two. Emma putting the pressure on right from the hop here. Emma looks like she's evened up the gap. Out front, Mangan still has a little bit of an edge, gets out in the soft stuff. Here comes Hemmergarten on the blue course side, pulls alongside on the blue, starting to stretch it out. You know what happens, everybody. Oh, she gets back in the tails, a little bit twisted as they make their way through the alley. Hammering the way of the course is Mangan. She has the advantage at the first one. We see it before in the red course. Can she make it up at the oh, bottom here? Look, look at this. this. Mangan going to be there first. Across the line she goes. Trisha Mangan moves into the final. She's been here before. Trisha. Over. Oh, oh boy, so this is setting things up for a very interesting final. Next up on Life in Between Gates, it's the finals of day two, where both the world champions and world pro ski tour season point leader will be crowned. In general, ski racing is a pretty tough sport. Race is ready. Using my DNA vibe has allowed me to train harder, longer, and recover faster. Less days off, more time on the snow, beating my competitors. Having another option to be doing what we love and to continue to race, it just keeps the sport open, keeps you in it. Life in Between Gates is brought to you by Surefoot, DNA Vibe, CB Sports, Tough Shed, Mazda, and Taos, home of the 2023 World Pro Ski Tour World Championships. Now it's time for heat one of the big final for $20,000 between the American River Radimus and the Canadian Jeffrey Reed. That's a lot of money on the line. They are gonna have to hustle, really working those skis, get nice arcs down to the bottom, their neck and neck coming into Pro Tour Alley, and Radimus pops out in front of Reed. But remember, the red course, if you run it direct, and that's what Jeff does, runs a nice direct line coming down through the finish, this is gonna be very close. It's Reed by .227. He'll take that advantage into the second run. This is it, folks, and in 20 seconds, a winner will be crowned. River on the red with two tenths to make up over Jeffrey Reed on the blue. And this is their 10th run of the day. They are running on adrenaline right now, trying to focus mentally and physically attack this track. It's gonna take all the ounces of energy that they have left in their tank. Coming down to the bottom, here we come into Tour Alley. Jeff moves out in front of River almost by a full gate. Will it be enough? Can River pull some time back on him? Jeff goes, touches down before River. Coming to the final gates, it'll be Jeffrey Reed who becomes the World Pro Ski Tour Taos Giant Slalom World Champion. Yeah, I was definitely pushing it yesterday and we're gonna still push it today, but hopefully we're gonna be on our feet the whole way. That's the plan. <laughs> Back to the top now, heat number one for $20,000 between Milzinski and Mangan. Both ladies firing on all cylinders, knifing those turns down on the top of the first jump. Mangan gets on her inside ski, gets a little wide, late, throwing some snow. Milzinski taking advantage of that, trying to put the pressure on Mangan. Coming down onto the flat, getting down low, working those grooves. There's the speed specialist getting down low in her tuck. Mangan knows she needs to really work the hill for terrain, search for speed at all costs. Mangan taking the bad girl land down through the last few gates. 
crossing the line with slight advantage, 0.290. This is it, folks. This is the final race of the day, deciding who stands on top of the podium and who stands one step down. And the intensity is so high. Mangan gets a pretty good start, and, and Milzinski's going to have to scramble to catch her. That's a little bit of a distance, almost a full gate now that Mangan has over Milzinski. Coming to these turns, Milzinski trying to rail him, trying to make some smooth arcs, and coming down here on the bottom, Mangan pulling that tuck, trying to really generate speed, generate energy from gate to gate, getting low to the snow, trying to stay aerodynamic, coming off the waterfall, pushing the line to the limit, Mangan powers her way down through the final gates to become the World Pro Ski Tour 2023 Taos Giant Slalom World Champion. Let's take it down to the Corbell California Champagne Awards celebration. Jeff Reed wins the 2023 World Pro Ski Tour Taos World Championship Giant Slalom. Trisha Mangan will take home a check for $20,000. And Reno Schmidiger becomes the World Pro Ski Tour 2023 Taos Men's Overall World Champion. And congrats to Aaron Milzinski, the World Pro Ski Tour Taos Women's Overall World Champion. What a great season it's been on the World Pro Ski Tour. And here's a look at your 2023 season champions, Aaron Milzinski and Simone Camelander. We want to send out a big thank you to Taos Ski Valley for hosting the World Championships for a second year in a row. What a great winter it's been, and thanks to all of you for joining us. In grand fashion, two champions were crowned in both the men's and women's division. For the men, Switzerland's Rito Schmidiger captured the world championship with a first place finish on day one and having reached the quarterfinals on day two. Simone Kamalander hung on to capture the World Pro Ski Tour season point standings by a narrow margin of 123 to 115 over David Ketterer. Michael Ankeny finished third. On the women's side, it was a clean sweep for the Canadian, Erin Milzinski. She finished the two days with two second place finishes to capture the world title. Americans Trisha Mangan and Paula Molson finished second and third. In the World Pro Ski Tour season ending point standings, it was a runaway for the Canadian as she completed the 2023 season with three first and three second place finishes. What a year it was in 2023 on the World Pro Ski Tour. And we'll recap the entire season next time on Life in Between Gates. You're watching the 2023 World Pro Ski Tour.